I'm not going to use the 23rd Psalm too much in my sermon today, but before I move on, I do want to say a word about it that links it to my sermon. And of course, we often read the 23rd Psalm at times of difficulty, at times of personal suffering. Uh, I often read it as one of the passages at funerals that I lead for the congregation. And there is a powerful sense of comfort that we get from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, of course, which means I shall lack nothing, I shall have everything I need. God makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters and skipping to the end. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. There's a wonderful sense of comfort and assurance in that. And it is indeed important to use the psalm for that purpose, for that personal comfort and assurance. This is a message for each of us in times of need. And yet, Scripture is bigger, really, than any one use to which we put it. And it's very easy to ask the question when we read that 23rd Psalm, but aren't we all linked together? The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want, but what about everyone else? The Lord leads me beside still waters and green pastures, but What about all of those for whom there is nothing but turbulent waters and dry grass? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. But what about my connection to those who seem to have no mercy and for whom goodness seems far away? Those are also legitimate questions to ask upon reading the 23rd Psalm. And in a sense, I want to address the psalm at that level today. Before I go on to the reading from John, I want to read the other scripture reading. I didn't include it in the worship order, but I want to read the other lectionary reading for today, which comes from the book of 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John is not a book we hear too often from in the lectionary, but this is the lectionary epistle reading for the day. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases God. And this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit that he has given us. And now on to the reading from the Gospel of John, from the 10th chapter. Jesus says to his disciples, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life 
for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the imagery contained in these scripture readings today is among the most familiar imagery in the Bible to most of us. First, as you heard, we had the reading of Psalm 23, which probably is the most well-known single passage of scripture in all of the Bible. And then we had the image in the Gospel of John of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. And from as far back as we have record in the history of the church, the early church, there are images of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. You may recognize contemporary versions of it. Uh, you can picture it in your mind of Jesus uh, with his shepherdly robes on and carrying a lamb on his shoulders. Of course, few today live among sheep, so we tend to just skim the surface of the images in these passages. We get the basic idea that back in the day, sheep needed someone to look out for them, and Jesus looks out for us. We are comforted by the fact that Jesus will somehow keep bad things from happening to us, like a shepherd keeps bad things happening from the, to the sheep, and that God, Jesus, will give us all we need to stay alive and safe. And that's what shepherds do. And Jesus is the good shepherd. But honestly, it's not always how things work. Jesus keeps bad things from happening to us? What about Angola and the Ivory Coast and other places of horrific war in Africa? What about juvenile detention that you've heard me talk about? What about the emergency room? What about the domestic violence hotline? The therapist's office. The good shepherd keeps us safe? Really? If we allow ourselves to really listen to the passage today, we might find something a little more honest, more life-giving, really, than just a surface-level sense that Jesus keeps us from all harm. Looking a little deeper at these passages begins with realizing that when Jesus claims to be the good shepherd, he is claiming to take the place of the bad shepherd. The rulers of the people of Israel were traditionally known as shepherds, and the rulers were frequently criticized for abusing the sheep. In the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, the rulers are criticized for being worthless shepherds, not caring about the real well-being of the sheep, exercising no justice for the sheep, and God kicks out all of the rulers and takes their place. And in New Testament times, the Romans cynically used the image of shepherding the people, the people that they know full well they were abusing and oppressing with every action they took. And so if we read these passages and want to begin to understand what they might mean for us today, we have to think about our own rulers and whether they are bad shepherds. But we barely know who our rulers are. Indeed, we live in a democracy, and so we are, in some sense at least, our own rulers. And surely we're not our own bad shepherds, are we? Are we? The Bible, it turns out, can help us understand 
the situation that we face today because the Bible is very insightful of its analysis of that which has power over us. It turns out that it is not simply rulers as individual people, not simply those individual people who are the bad shepherds, but what the Bible calls the principalities and powers. Herod, Caesar, even the beast of the book of Revelation, and the Jewish authorities who lord it over the people as they cooperate with the Romans in the oppression, all of them don't really matter as individuals. They matter as manifestations of systems to which we all contribute. To put a, point, to put a fine point on it, these are the death-dealing systems that we all contribute to. Remember, as Jesus faced his trial and the cross, you heard these passages just a few weeks ago at Easter. Before Easter, they all forsook him and fled. The disciples were caught up in, and indeed were even equally creators of, the system that killed Jesus. The Bad shepherd is not a person lording it over us today. It is a system of which we all are a part. Now, as you know, I talk each week with kids in juvenile detention, mostly 14, 15, 16-year-old boys, mostly African-American boys, Juvenile detention isn't what it used to be. I don't know if you have some image of it from bygone days, but this is not a place for kids who break windows or get caught skipping school or even smoke pot. If you spend more than a couple days there, you are probably charged with a violent offense, things like aggravated assault, armed robbery, attempted murder. A good number of them have been gangbangers since they were 11 or 12 years old and were wrapped up in that life, influenced by it by as young as age 9. Now, I believe that young people are capable of real decision-making and that they bear responsibility for their own actions. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But I also believe that nothing we do as humans, good or bad, is done in a vacuum. The social environment, the system that we are a part of, significantly shapes the options that are truly available to us in life. And each Tuesday afternoon when I walk out of juvenile detention, I have a series of images in my mind, and one of those images that frequently comes to mind is a deck of cards. And each of us individually is a card in that deck. Now the, the standard thought of our community, our, here in Rockford, our society in general, seems to be that the kids at Juvie are simply bad cards in the deck. They've been ruined somehow. You can flip through the deck and pull out an individual card and get rid of it and all is well with the rest of the deck. But the image that actually carries forth in my mind is not just of a deck of cards, but of a, a house of cards. Now, a house of cards is unstable because each card puts pressure on the other cards around it, but unlike a nice solid home, well-built, the pressures in a deck of cards are not balanced, and so it's inherently unstable. And eventually, one of those cards is going to fail to support the pressure that's placed on it, and the whole thing's going to come falling down. The kids at Juvie are those cards that fail under the pressure of the system that's placed upon them. And the point is that they didn't fail in isolation, but they failed as part of a system, a system of which we are all a part as members of this community, as members of the human family, 
or to put it more clinically, I guess you might say, more analytically, the kids in juvie individually embody the isolated failures of a dysfunctional social system that the rest of us live in, support, and indeed benefit from. And yeah, that's right, what I am saying is that they are there in part because of us. The Bible says that when one cries, all cry together. It's not because each of us individually can muster that much compassion for the one that cries, but because we are all part of one body. Yes, we are our own bad shepherd. We are the hired hand who runs away when the sheep are threatened. We forsook him and fled. And you see, of course, that while we are all responsible, we are also victims of this system. I mean, think about it. Think about the shallowness of our culture the consumerism that we use to hide that shallowness. Think of the toll we're taking on the environment, the, the wars that we seem to have no choice but to support. 40% of adult women in our society on mood-enhancing prescription drugs. 50% of the population unhealthily overweight. Half of marriages ending in divorce. Indeed, when one cries, all cry together. Maybe now we can see what it means to say that Jesus is the good shepherd. The good shepherd who is always with his sheep, who knows the sheep individually, and who lays down his life for those sheep. Jesus can only be the good shepherd because he has become part of this system. God became a human being and lived among us, was one of us, and he became the good shepherd for us. God has taken up a place here among us as Jesus. God cast God's lot with us so that God could do something new in our midst. The Good Shepherd knows all of the sheep individually. He knows me. He knows you. He knows the kids in juvie better than any of us know ourselves, more honestly than we know ourselves. He knows how I and you and they contribute to the system. He knows how my part in the system inflicts pain, and he knows how the pain that I suffer comes from this system. Jesus knows me. He knows me. And in spite of all I am, and somehow in the mystery of God's love, because of who I am, he treasures me. You, individually, are precious to him. And because he is the good shepherd, the kids at juvie are invaluable to him. And we are then at last to what is really the breathtaking part of this passage. Jesus is the good shepherd. Why? Because he lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus, in other words, took all of the pressures of the dysfunctional house of cards, the dysfunctional system, upon himself, even to the point of death. He did everything he could to protect the sheep, 
by absorbing the injustice, the pain, the suffering, the sacrifice. And notice how careful Scripture is in saying that he did this voluntarily. No one took his life. He didn't crack under the strain and the pressure. He willingly, intentionally laid down his life for me and for you and for the kids at Juvie, absorbing everything, absorbing death itself, absorbing everything so that it could not destroy us. This is no beautiful tragedy, though. This is no sadly poetic moment. This is not just a singular moment in which love was conquered by hate, but managed to beautifully remain true to the end. This is not a time when good was swarmed by evil, but valiantly kept its integrity all the way to the finish. No, this was no finish at all. This was no end at all. For the good shepherd laid down his life in order that he might take it up again. This was not an end. This was, this is, a new beginning. The good shepherd opens up a new world for a sheep because we are freed from the bad shepherd. We are freed from ourselves. We are freed from the system that we ourselves create and the system that is killing us. Just as surely it drains our life as it drains life from those 14 and 15 and 16 year old young men. That's the invitation we're given, you see, to be part of this new system that God has created through the death and resurrection of Jesus. That is what, it's, that is, what is at stake each time we gather for worship and each time we try to carry that worship into the world that we live in every day we are invited to be part of a world a, a, a new system in which we follow the good shepherd who laid down his life in order that he might take it up again and create all things new now you want to know of course what that new way of life looks like. It looks like Jesus. It looks like love. It looks like those who use their gifts for the benefit of others. It looks like those who humbly recognize the system is not only killing kids at juvie. The system, which we create and sustain and benefit from, it's killing us as well. It looks, well, it looks like this. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's good and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.